Uh, everyone, good morning. Uh, this is Brendan Jordan with the Great Plains Institute. Uh, I want to welcome everyone to today's webinar. This is the first in a series of webinars on the opportunity for capturing carbon in Nebraska. Uh, today we're going to cover a lot of the basics about uh, the resource opportunity, uh, the, the different sources of CO2 that might be able to participate, uh, some of the uh, national and regional initiatives, and some of the uh, underlying economics and geology. On future webinars, we're going to dive deeper into uh, some of the specific case studies uh, and uh, how, how this ca carbon capture opportunity will play out for particular types of industrial facilities. Uh, I'd like to just uh, start by uh, introducing our, our co-host today, uh, Andrew Duguid with Patel. And Andrew uh, really has headed up the, uh, the current round of research uh, in Nebraska as the lead on the, uh, the Carbon Safe, uh, DOE funded Carbon Safe initiative. Uh, Andrew, uh, do you want to offer some brief opening remarks before we get into presentations? Yeah. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. Um, and, and I apologize for my weather radio going off on a test right there as I unmuted. Um, so uh, yeah, no, I, I'm really happy to be um, working in Nebraska on this on this topic. I, I think you know, it's been a lot of fun. Um, not a lot of work had been done in, in Nebraska up until when we started this project about three and a half years ago. And I think there's there's a lot of potential for, for projects and I'm excited to, to kind of build excitement and, and keep going. So on that, we can kind of just dive right in. All right, thanks, Andrew. Uh, again, you know, here's the, the, the basic agenda for today. And I, I will also at the end circle back and, and uh, offer thanks to our uh, co-hosts. So we've had a number of co-hosts for this event and who've, who've been really helpful in, in shaping the agenda and uh, uh, helping to get the word out. Uh, so we'll, we'll circle back on, on uh, specific thanks to our co-hosts. Uh, at this point, I'm gonna turn things over to my colleague, uh, Brad Crabtree, uh, who's a, a VP at, at Great, Great Plains Institute, overseeing our, our carbon management team uh, one of the founders of the National Carbon Capture Coalition and, and uh, a leader in a variety of uh, uh, federal and regional initiatives related to carbon capture. Brad, I'm going to stop share and uh, let you go ahead and share your, your screen. Great. Thank you, Brendan. Appreciate the introduction. And it's uh, great to be here. An amazing turnout um, shows, I think, underscores the interest uh, in carbon capture in Nebraska. And I'm just uh, um, showing my slides here. Does that uh, appear okay, Brendan, on the screen? I'm not seeing it yet. Hmm. Try it again. There we go. It's working. Okay. I don't know what I did differently the first time. But, so I'm, uh, I'm right now I'm seeing, I'm not seeing it in slide. Oh yeah, perfect. There, there we go. go. Okay. Well, thank you uh, again. Good morning, everyone. I'll just jump right in. I'll, um, as Brendan said, I'll, I'll start by just uh, addressing what I would say are some key observations or facts about carbon capture generally, and then talk about efforts at the federal level to enact policy to incentivize the deployment of carbon capture transport of CO2 and its geologic storage, and also in particular um, what's been happening in recent weeks uh, in terms of recommendations to Congress around COVID-19 and potential economic recovery efforts, and then close with initiatives at the state and regional level, uh, which will be built on by my colleagues Dane and, and Andrew in more detail. So uh, as far as the carbon, uh, Great Plains Institute, we've actually been working on carbon capture in one way or another since 2002. And there you see the timeline of our work. Um, more, more recently, we began the Carbon Capture Coalition in 2011 and then the State Carbon Capture Work Group now with 16 states in 2015. And then in 2018, 
began a whole range of initiatives, including uh, efforts involving stakeholders in Nebraska to take advantage of the 45Q tax credit, which I'll talk about in a moment. Let me first start by emphasizing the fact that carbon capture technology works. Uh, you will often see in the media references to carbon capture being unproven uh, or not yet commercial. That is simply untrue in any way, shape, or form. Um, the actual commercial and large-scale history of deployment of carbon capture in the United States is nearly 50 years long. It goes back to 1972 in West Texas when they began separating CO2 from natural gas processing. I won't read to you all the examples of commercial scale deployment of carbon capture going back to 72, but simply to point out that you see an evolution of core carbon capture technologies that have been around for decades being applied commercially at scale in various industries. Again, starting with gas processing, but then uh, fertilizer in the 1980s, um, gasification, and then um, obviously, uh, Ethanol is of great importance to Nebraska and commercial scale capture from ethanol began in the latter part of the previous decade. And then we saw the introduction of carbon capture to refining and ultimately to electric power generation um, in the past uh, number of years. Uh, we also have carbon capture uh, uh, at scale in steel production overseas as well. Right now, there are 13 commercial scale carbon capture facilities in the US. They have the capacity to capture on the order of 25 million metric tons of CO2 per year. And there are over 5,200 miles of CO2 pipeline infrastructure. What that says is that from a technology standpoint, we know enough to scale up carbon capture technology economy wide. It doesn't mean that the level of deployment is sufficient to meet economic and environmental needs, but we know that we can do it. What remains is a policy and a political challenge, not fundamentally a technological one. The other uh, often significant misunderstanding is that carbon capture is too expensive. Um, the reality is when you look at the cost of carbon capture by industry and use the metric of what it cap costs to capture and manage a ton of CO2, it actually compares very favorably to a whole host of low and zero carbon technology options, including wind, solar, and even energy efficiency in certain contexts. The cost of capture depends in large measure on the purity of the CO2 stream. So the more pure the, the CO2 being emitted from a facility, the less it costs to capture that CO2 on a per ton basis. So unsurprisingly, uh, ethanol, natural gas processing, and ammonia production for fertilizer all produce very pure streams of CO2, and you see those capture costs at very, very low levels, 15 to $20 per ton. That's cheaper than renewable energy except for hydropower. Uh, then when the concentrations increase to 16 to 50 percent, that's hydrogen, cement production, refining, steel production. We're in that 40 to $60 category, still competitive, in some cases cheaper than renewables. And then when you get up into power generation, first coal fired and then natural gas, that's where you start to see the higher costs. And um, even there, depending on the application, uh, carbon capture is still cost effective with other low and zero carbon technology options. The bottom line is that if we have the policy framework in place to reward the emissions reductions from carbon capture, it can compete today. The other important point to make is that in certain sectors, carbon capture is simply not optional if we want to reduce emissions. About a third of global carbon emissions come from industrial sectors, in other words, not from power generation or from transportation. About half of those emissions globally come from just three sectors, steel, cement, and basic chemicals. And over half the emissions from those three sectors uh, come from what are called process emissions. What that means is they're not related to the energy inputs to power those industrial processes. Instead, the CO2 emissions come from the chemistry of the process itself. You cannot produce Portland cement, for example, without emitting CO2 emissions, and you cannot run a blast furnace uh, without emitting CO2, regardless of your, your energy resource that you're powering the, the system with. 
And from a climate standpoint, carbon capture is simply essential. All of the modeling that's been done to show how we might meet mid-century emissions reduction goals demonstrates this. The International Energy Agency has modeled meeting the two degree goal, which was agreed to in Paris. And what that modeling finds that is that over that, between 2015 and 2050, uh, 14% of total emissions reductions must come from carbon capture. And by the time we get to 2050, that's 20% 20 of total emissions. The IPCC fifth assessment, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, um, showed that if we don't include carbon capture, it costs nearly 140% more to meet the goal. The most recent modeling, which is for the more ambitious 1.5 degrees Celsius goal, is really dramatic. Not only do, would we need to have economy-wide deployment of carbon capture uh, around the world, but we would also have to be capturing CO2 from the atmosphere, CO2 that's already in the atmosphere in order to meet that goal. And then finally, you'll often hear that carbon capture is a niche. It's great where you have a place to store the CO2, uh, and if the, you, know, you don't need to have a very long pipeline and you can make it all work, that's great. But it isn't a solution that you can do everywhere. That's also just not true. First of all, uh, in the United States alone, in the oil and gas industry, we've injected nearly 1.5 billion tons of CO2 going back to 1972. That's about 65 to 70 million tons per year, about 3% of U.S. oil production results from that CO2 injection. It's important to note, with putting a half, one and a half billion tons of CO2 into the subsurface, nobody has died and there's been no major environmental incidents. We would be challenged to find industrial activity on that kind of a scale with that kind of a, a track record. The other important thing is that most of the CO2 injection that has occurred to date has been done commercially for the purposes of enhanced oil recovery, but CO2 is stored in the process. Many people will dismiss that and say, well, it makes no sense to capture CO2 and then go and produce more oil and emit as much CO2 in the process. That's actually not what's happened. There have been over a dozen authoritative studies of the life cycle emissions reductions from CO2 injection for enhanced oil recovery. The most uh, referenced analysis is done, by, again, by the International Energy Agency, and they found that on a barrel-to-barrel -barrel basis that there's a 37% net emission reduction in life cycle emissions, even after you include the oil that's produced in the process. We've also stored, uh, demonstrated the saline geologic storage at scale in multiple locations. Uh, commercially, the most, and that's of course where you inject the CO2 in the saline formation and you don't produce oil in the process. ADM in Illinois, Shell in Alberta, and Equinor in the North Sea have been doing this successfully at millions of tons. Uh, and then finally, we have more room to put the CO2 in oil and gas formations and saline reservoirs then we really have need. We have centuries to thousands of years worth of storage. So this is much more than a bridge for all intents and purposes. This could be a permanent part of our climate portfolio. So that was just a bit of an overview on the economics, the technology, and the environmental aspects of carbon capture. Um, I'm going to talk now about the federal and state initiatives going on, uh, and I'll talk about three things, the Carbon Capture Coalition at the federal level, the state carbon capture work group, and then the regional carbon capture deployment initiatives. First of all, the Carbon Capture Coalition has been in existence for nearly a decade. It now has over 75 members. It includes uh, some of the largest energy, industrial, and technology companies in the United States, most of the major industry and energy sector labor unions, and some of the most prominent national environmental and clean energy NGOs. Um, it is simply the most diverse energy and climate coalition that exists in the United States today, and there's a reason for that. It's because carbon capture has really broad benefits. It's beneficial for the economy, for jobs, and the environment. The goal of the economy-wide deployment of carbon capture for all three of those reasons. I won't lead, read you the list of the uh, uh, participants and observers in the Carbon Capture Coalition, but if you scroll those, the, the slide here, you'll see the diversity of the companies, the unions, and the environmental and conservation organizations that participate.
So for the first uh, six or seven years of its existence, the Carbon Capture Coalition focused on, on a single main goal, which was the reform and expansion of the 45Q tax credit. So and those of you you're in Nebraska, you're familiar with the wind industry, um, you're aware of the wind production tax credit, or maybe to a lesser degree, the investment tax credit for solar energy. Think of the 45Q tax credit as the same thing, for, but for carbon capture technologies across a range of industries. Um, the, um, the reform that was enacted in the beginning of 2018 by Congress, uh, was done so on a bipartisan basis. There were 25 senators that co-sponsored the legislation, 18 Republicans, I'm sorry, 18 Democrats, six Republicans and one independent. And there were 50 House members and it was kind of the reverse in terms of the, the proportion. It was 35 Republicans and 15 Democrats. So it wasn't just a little bit bipartisan, it was deeply bipartisan. Um, what it did is it raised the value of the existing 45Q tax credit to $10 a, from $10 a ton to $35 per ton for every ton of CO2 stored through the process of enhanced oil recovery and $50 per metric ton if you're storing that CO2 in a saline reservoir. The important thing to note here is this is not a tax credit for enhanced oil recovery. That's widely misunderstood. It is a tax credit for geologic storage or for the utilization of CO2. If you use the CO2 for, for example, making low carbon fuels as a feedstock or chemicals, building products, advanced materials, any, anywhere CO2 can be turned into a commodity and a product of value. Um, the other important thing in a place like uh, Nebraska is that uh, you can transfer the tax credit. So if the owner of the carbon capture facility happens to be a co-op, you have many co-ops in the Great Plains, um, they can transfer the tax credit to an investor or another partner who has the tax appetite to take advantage of the tax credit. The other thing that we did in the reform of 45Q is we made sure that the threshold for participation was lowered. It used to be that you needed 500,000 tons of CO2 captured a year to qualify. That's now down to 100,000 tons. So it really opened up participation for the ethanol industry, fertilizer, gas processing, a whole range of industries that are important throughout the midsection of the United States. Um, it, so 45Q tax credit is a critical cornerstone policy now in place, but we like, like we have with wind and solar, if we want economy-wide deployment of carbon capture, we need a full, full federal policy portfolio. Uh, and so the Carbon Capture Co Coalition last year began an effort to develop uh, a federal policy blueprint that outlines what that broader suite of po policies at the federal level should be to build on and complement the 45Q tax credit in was quite significant. We got all of the 75 companies, unions, and NGOs to agree on this policy blueprint. Um, so looking ahead, we're now focused on making sure that the 45Q tax credit gets implemented effectively. Uh, we've been pressuring Treasury now for well over a year to get the guidance and the proposed rule completed. The guidance came out in February and we expect the final rule, the proposed final rule to be out in a matter of weeks. Um, we're also now very focused on other policies to complement 45Q, particularly financial incentives. Uh, now that we can use the 45Q tax credit to finance carbon capture facilities, we also need pipeline infrastructure to get the CO2 from where it's captured to where it can be geologically stored. And we have worked on legislation that would provide a, a role for federal financing of new CO2 pipeline infrastructure. And then we are also trying to expand the focus of federal policy so it's not just about carbon capture and power generation, but the whole suite of industrial sectors uh, where you can capture uh, and store CO2. And finally, in light of the COVID-19 pandemic and the economic crisis, we are working on recommendations that will both help uh, create demand for industries and support jobs in the near term, but also position our economy for carbon capture in the future. So I'll just say a bit very quickly about the economic recovery recommendations that we just released uh, last month uh, to Congress on carbon capture. 
Right now, thanks to 45Q being, act, being enacted two years ago, there are just a little over 25 carbon capture and storage projects under development. To give you some, to think about the context, we have about 13 commercial scale carbon capture facilities operating in the United States today. This is would be roughly uh, double the number of projects that exist, so a tripling of total carbon capture projects that are would occur if these projects were to move forward. They are all at risk now because of the COVID-19 crisis, in principally because not only the delays associated with the financial uncertainty, but also these projects rely on tax equity investment. And in the current crisis, tax equity markets are either constrained or non-existent. So we looked at what would be things that Congress could do that could, one, provide near-term economic and jobs benefits for economic recovery, two, would not require government to do anything new but rely on existing legislation and programs, and three, would have the potential for broad bipartisan political support. Those were the three criteria that we used, and we came up with a series of recommendations. The top priority is to provide for direct pay for the Section 45Q tax credit. Uh, what that means is rather than claiming a tax credit on your on your tax return, um, instead you would get a you would get a payment in the form of a a tax uh, refund on your tax return, so cash. And the benefit of that is that you don't have to resort to tax equity markets to finance a project, but instead you can receive cash directly from the federal government and apply that to the financing of your project. Um, stay tuned, there's a number of organizations, not just the Carbon Capture Coalition, but also the American Wind Energy Association, Solar Energy Industries Association, and others that are working together to try to advance direct pay, not only for 45Q, but a host of energy tax credits. The second major priority is to extend 45Q. When the, when the legislation was enacted, Congress gave us six years authorization for the 45Q tax credit. What that means is that any project has to begin construction by the end of 2023. But we've lost over two years to the delays from the IRS on guidance. And now with the COVID-19 crisis, projects are being delayed or even stopped. So there's a very real risk that <clears throat> projects will be canceled because they can't meet that commence construction deadline. So there are three proposals in Congress right now to extend 45Q. There's one in the House from House Republicans that would make the 45Q tax credit permanent. Um, that was actually included in the House GOP climate package. There's a one-year proposal from House Democrats, and then there's a five-year bipartisan proposal in the Senate. Um, we're working hard to make sure that whatever happens, it's a multi-year extension of the tax credit. Um, I'll quickly go through some other things, and this will be important to work that uh, Andrew is going to talk about uh, later on, but the Carbon Safe Project, four projects have advanced, will now advance to the final stages of uh, Carbon Safe, which is to fund the development of geologic storage projects, but two others have not been funded, and there are more projects that could be developed, so we're proposing funding to allow 10 projects to move through the program. Also. Uh, DOE cost share for commercial demonstration of carbon capture technologies in multiple industries, including some industries like cement and steel in the U.S., which do not yet have commercial projects. Also, feed studies to finance the engineering of, of new projects. And then the development of large-scale commercial, large -scale commercial saline storage facilities, <clears throat> facilities as well are also proposed. Um, we need to make sure that, that EPA and the states have the capacity to permit all these new projects that are moving into the pipeline, especially for saline geologic storage. So we're proposing uh, funding uh, so that EPA and states have enough staff to manage the demand to, to uh, respond, do the permitting. Uh, and then finally, several other quick re recommendations. One, uh, for those interested in the power sector, the 48A tax credit can fund, finance the uh, retrofit of existing uh, coal-fired power plants, except that uh, they cannot meet the current heat rate requirements in the 48A program. So there's legislation that would change that heat rate requirement and free up $2 billion that's already available for projects. 
We also want to make sure that folks developing carbon capture projects can get access to tax-exempt debt and make them eligible for private activity bonds. And then finally, the DOE loan program um, uh, has about $8 billion in loan guarantee authority for advanced fossil energy projects, especially carbon capture, that can't be accessed because of challenges to the design of the program. And so these would be fixed as well. So here to close, I'm just going to briefly go through uh, a bit of what's happening at the state and regional level. If you think about the history of energy policy in the United States, it's not just actions by Congress that help to develop new industries, it's also leadership from states. Uh, the biofuels industry is a, is a terrific case in point. In addition to the renewable fuel standard, you have a whole host of state policies to support development of the industry, also true for wind and solar. Carbon capture will be no different. So with that in mind, uh, at the Great Plains Institute, we reached out to state officials in nine or 10 states back in 2015. And Governor Meade then of Wyoming, a Republican, and Governor Bullock, the current Democratic governor of Montana, both showed particular interest and agreed to co-chair what became the State Carbon Capture Work Group. Today, there are 16 states that you see in green that participate in the work group, and a number of states that are lighter green that have shown interest. Um, we would love to color in Nebraska on that map and have Nebraska become the 17th state in the Carbon Capture Work Group. Um, in the when the group first got going in the 2015 to 2017 time frame we focused on the development of federal and state policy recommendations and then with the passage of the 45q tax credit in 2018 um, the governors asked us to focus on making projects happen to get steel on the ground was their directive to all of us and so we began what is now a multi-year effort to develop the regional carbon capture deployment initiatives and i'll talk about these here right now so here just to reference our four major reports and white papers with modeling and policy recommendations when you get these slides after the webinar, these are links. I encourage any of you to take a look at the work of the state work group. These reports are very helpful if you're trying to get, get familiar with carbon capture and the opportunities. I just mentioned the regional deployment initiatives. You see uh, the, the Midwest or mid-continent region is really Midwestern states plus the Gulf Coast, and then the Western states there and Oklahoma and Texas are in both regions because the way CO2 pipeline infrastructure is likely to build out, it would come from both regions to Oklahoma and Texas. So that's the geography we're currently working with. You'll see that Nebraska is included in the map because we do have stakeholder participation from Nebraska and hope to expand that to state officials as well. Uh, it's been a three-phase three phase project. We're in phase three now. Uh, from January to se September of 2018, we did initial modeling, mapping of uh, potential carbon capture facilities, CO2 uh, pipelines, and, and storage locations. Then in late 2018, we began bringing state officials and stakeholders from these two large regions together. And in the past year, we completed the modeling, which uh, my colleague Dane will talk about in detail. We've also been engaging uh, individual state policy, state policymakers in the individual states and working with those states to develop policy teams, uh, which include state officials and industry, agricultural, um, labor, and NGO stakeholders working with them. Um, just a moment, please. Um, Excuse me, I'm like many of us, I'm working from home and had an interruption. I had to um, say something, I apologize. So I'm not going to talk about the modeling that's been done through the Regional Deployment Initiative. Dane's whole presentation is about that, but I just wanted to give you a slide of the modeling results just to give you a feel for the work that state officials and stakeholders together did with the modeling team. More to come in a moment. Um, we are also engaging with all the states on policy development. 
And the goal of the policy development is to help states become carbon capture ready. What's meant by that is we now have the 45Q tax credit in place at the federal level now until the end of 2023. Hopefully we'll extend it, but at least to the end of 2023. And if states are to take full economic advantage of the 45Q tax credit, then they need to have the types of enabling policies in place at the state level so companies developing projects will be willing and able to develop projects in their states. And there you see listed kind of an outline of the types of policies that are included in the checklist that we've developed um, and the state policy teams that we're helping establish in the various states are using that checklist to, got, to see what gaps they need to fill in their states and develop policies based on the modeling and analysis that's been done. <clears throat> we're also trying to make them available online. So uh, this is, website is a work in progress. It first went online in December, and we continue to add information and analysis and work products to it. But if you go to www.carboncaptureready.org, you can scan the website, see some of the modeling results. We're developing an inventory of state policies, uh, uh, issue by issue uh, for all the individual states with references, uh, a number of resources. We're also helping the 25 or so states in the modeling area uh, develop fact sheets and drawing on the analysis and the graphics and so forth so that governor, staff, state legislators, uh, leaders like yourselves have access to specific information and project opportunities in your states. And then when the question we've been most asked is, do we have jobs numbers? And so at the beginning of the year, we, bit the bullet and made a financial commitment to hire the Rhodium Group, which is a respected national uh, research organization to do first ever jobs analysis on what large scale deployment of carbon capture would look like in terms of jobs and private investment between now and 2050. And um, by the end of this process, uh, late this year, uh, or early next year, we hope to have fact sheets with jobs analysis for all the states available, as well as national estimates. And then my final slide is just to end on some thoughts about where all this is going, and Dean will go deeper into this. But what the modeling and all the work with state officials and stakeholders from throughout our region has shown is that we have a real economic opportunity uh, in building what we're calling carbon, regional carbon hubs. One is economies of scale. The modeling shows that if we bring together carbon capture projects across industries and across regions and cluster them around common pipeline infrastructure, we can generate significant economy of sale, uh, scale savings. Uh, and the way we do that is by working together through state and regional planning, policy development, and project deployment so that we can maximize the opportunity currently in front of us with the 45Q tax credit while there's still time. And then my final thought is, and I would encourage all of you to think of carbon capture as addre addressing a challenge and reframing that challenge as an economic opportunity. What we're really talking about is reducing emissions, uh, either sustaining or even increasing domestic energy industrial production and supporting high wage jobs, all while we build a new carbon economy. And with that, uh, Brendan, I'll close in and thank everybody um, for joining us and be happy to take questions later. Thank you very much, Brad. And we will hold questions till the end. If you uh, can go ahead and stop your share, uh, I'm gonna hand Just things did. over directly over to uh, Dane McFarlane who's the Director of Research at Great Plains Institute and has been leading our efforts uh, to under, better understand the, the economics of capture, transport, and storage, uh, what a, a pipeline network should look like, and uh, you know, thinking about the geography of, of both the sources and the sinks and how we can link these things together. Uh, Dane, I can see your slides and I invite you to, to, uh, to launch in. Great, hopefully you can hear me too can hear you just fine. All right, uh, thanks Brendan and Brad. Um, yeah, this is Dane McFarland, Director of Research at Great Plains Institute. And as Brad mentioned, um, the Regional Carbon Capture Deployment Initiative um, is just finishing up a two-year effort on modeling 
CO2 sources uh, in areas of storage throughout the U.S. So the, the goals of the study were first to identify near-term opportunities for CO2 capture uh, retrofit at existing industrial and power facilities, to locate areas of CO2 storage and utilization, and then to model optimize CO2 transport infrastructure. So on the right side, you see a map, which was our initial planning map based on uh, discussions with our industry participants and participants of the regional capture Car uh, carbon capture deployment initiative, just sketching out based on industry knowledge where um, participants thought uh, opportunistic areas of capture were and storage were and what were some likely regional corridors for CO2 transport, those being the, the large blue arrows on the map. So some of the primary partners of this analysis were, um, you know, the folks at GPI who you've been hearing from today, Stanford University, uh, at Alamos National Laboratory, Indiana Geological Survey, and the National Energy Technology Laboratory, or NETL. Um, and also on this call, Andrew Duguid at Battelle um, has also been a participant in that process. So on this map here, you can see uh, basically all of the industrial and power facilities throughout the U.S. Um, they are all shaded uh, as the light gray. Um, and the, the slightly darker gray or the teal color, hopefully that's coming through on your screen, are facilities that we identified as being eligible for the 45Q tax credit based on their annual emissions. So 45Q, as Brad mentioned, uh, offers a tax credit of $50 per ton for CO2 stored in geologic formations and $35 per ton stored elsewhere using EOR uh, storage or other uh, utilization. Uh, and the, the minimum capture thresholds for 45Q are 100,000 tons captured per year at industrial facilities and 500,000 tons of CO2 captured per year at power plants. So those are the dark teal. So you can see um, around the U.S. there are hundreds and hundreds of facilities eligible for 45Q if they installed capture at those rates. And then within that, uh, that group of facilities, there's a subset uh, colored in pink or purple that are facilities that our analysis identified as uh, very uh, opportunistic in the near and medium term for installing capture retrofit and linking up with regional networks for storage. So those facilities became the focus of our analysis. On the storage side, uh, we've been working with Los Alamos National Laboratory, Indiana Geological and Water Survey, as well as uh, the regional partnerships throughout the U.S. that worked with the Department of Energy to compile a database of geologic information uh, oriented towards identifying areas of storage uh, for CO2. On this map, um, in green, are areas uh, of, of saline, deep saline geologic formations that have been estimated by Los Alamos and Indiana Geological Survey um, to have storage and injection potential at a uh, very low cost of less than $5 per ton, including uh, injection and, and long-term storage. So you can see on this map that, you know, the western portions of Nebraska, uh, most of Wyoming, Colorado, and, and uh, many areas throughout uh, Kansas show pretty uh, good potential. And even the yellow areas are between $5 and $10 for, for injection costs. I mean, those are uh, cost initial estimates based on the, the Scott model published by Los Alamos. Uh, adding into that areas of potential utilization for CO2 and long-term storage, the, the darker gray shaded areas of this map are those same saline formations. And then the purple triangles are uh, existing oil fields with technical potential for EOR. So these are um, active petroleum basins that might uh, be able to uh, inject and long-term store CO2. So between the uh, initial map of sources, you can see a deep cluster within the Midwest and the upper Midwest and even the eastern portions of the Midwest and definitely healthy activity in uh, Nebraska and Kansas. But then when you look at the sources, um, there's basically a gap in the central Midwest. And this is where regional infrastructure corridors come into play. So just uh, going back to the sources real quick, Brad uh, showed this information in a table, but within the subset of facilities that we looked at in our analysis, 
Um, you can see on the left a scatter plot of each uh, sector of industry and the estimated capture costs we uh, determined at each facility. So you can see there's a great cluster of very low cost sources between 10 and $30 per ton for capture. That does not include transport costs and we um, assume transport costs to be between 10 to $20 per ton based on our work with the NETL CO2 transport cost model. Um, but on the left, uh, you know, some great opportunities definitely in the ethanol industry, ammonia, uh, gas processing. But even if you go up to the right, you know, the costs are a bit higher than those really pure sources. But as Brad mentioned, even at refineries, uh, cement, steel facilities, and gas and coal power plants, costs of less than $70 per ton for CO2 capture are still quite competitive with other carbon reducing strategies. Within uh, the, the Midwest and Mid-Continent region, um, as you can see the, on the map on the right, the yellow circles are ethanol facilities. Uh, you also see a few um, hydrogen production facilities, perhaps at refineries um, and a couple other maybe ammonia and then cement plants, as well as the power plants as well. So I th we found that in the Midwest and the Mid-Continent, um, these regions are uniquely positioned to, provi to provide low cost CO2 capture from the biofuels industry and a few other sectors. So the facilities we identified uh, within Kansas, Nebraska, Oklahoma, uh, definitely over 5 million metric tons of potential capture just from ethanol alone in Nebraska, 1.2 million tons from ethanol in Kansas, 1.6 million tons from cement, 600,000 tons from cement in Nebraska, um, as well as the power facilities. So there are a good uh, number of sources uh, offering low cost capture within uh, the mid-continent and Midwestern regions. Moving into our regional transport modeling, um, some of the major findings of our uh, analysis on CO2 transport infrastructure, there's definitely economies of scale that benefit higher capacity uh, transport infrastructure for CO2 delivery. Uh, we found that regional infrastructure planning can store more CO2 at a lower cost. So using uh, major trunk lines, which gather from many plants, rather than building individual uh, transport lines from one plant to one area of storage. And then long-term planning results in more CO2 stored, smaller land use, and lower marginal costs. And I'll show more on that in the coming slides. Our base scenario for this modeling effort uh, looked at linking up the near and medium term facilities that we identified with a regional transport network coordinated through the SIM CCS model, which is a mathematical model uh, created by Los Alamos National Labs that optimizes uh, the most minimal land use and the most minimal cost for capital investment of CO2 transport infrastructure while maximizing the amount of capture and storage of CO2. So on this map, uh, the circles are the many different industries that we linked up in the near and medium term. And then the, the black triangles are uh, petroleum basins with uh, potential for CO2 injection and long-term storage. And the blue triangles here are uh, areas for saline injection. So looking at Nebraska, Kansas, Oklahoma, like I mentioned before, um, in the upper parts of this region, maybe there's not as much um, low cost opportunity for, for geologic storage, but we found that Nebraska is actually keyly located for uh, strategic uh, placement of these transport corridors. There's a lot of low cost sources in the upper Midwest, including in Nebraska, definitely from the biofuels industry. And those sources will need to be transported to areas of storage and use in Oklahoma, Texas, Kansas, even in Colorado and Utah. So Nebraska is very strategically located within those transport corridors. We ran a high cost sensitivity scenario where uh, the pipeline and transport projects had to break even basically within the first few years of their operations. Um, so this really self-selected the most uh, opportunistic sources with low capture costs and the, the most opportunistic uh, sources for 
CO2 storage and built out a smaller transport network just to those sources. And even on this high cost sensitivity with a really crucial break-even criteria, Nebraska was very strategically positioned within those transport networks as well. Looking more towards the long term to a 2050 scenario with po potential uh, uh, you know, adoption of, of economy-wide deployment of CO2 to meet temperature targets, um, we saw that long-term planning for 2050 resulted in uh, nearly double the amount of storage. The initial scenario was about 300 million metric tons of storage per year. And this scenario by mid-century stores 670 million metric tons per year. Um, you can see there are many more blue triangles on this map. So uh, expansion of storage into deep saline formations and continued storage in petroleum basins. And again, uh, the upper parts of the Midwest Iowa, Nebraska, Kansas are very centrally located within these uh, nationwide regional transport infrastructure networks. So we see opportunities definitely with long-term planning um, of, for CO2 transport infrastructure, coordination between states along these corridors. Um, and out of this analysis um, arose the concept of regional CO2 hubs. So this is a concept for local and regional planning through industrial and public partnerships where you uh, basically tie together CO2 capture facilities, um, sites for storage and utilization of CO2, and plan out local and regional CO2 transport infrastructure. Local coordination and potential state policy to support the deployments and, capture, uh, and to capture in-state economic benefits um, of activities such as capital investment, labor and employment spending, daily operations of this transport infrastructure and capture equipment, and the annual servicing of this equipment through um, highly skilled technical labor. Um, that's a lot of economic activity across these sectors. Um, so establishing regional CO2 hubs to really tie all, all of this together and coordinate in long-term planning uh, will definitely ensure uh, more uh, of that beneficial economic activity will be captured within the state. The original deployment initiative is about to release um, its analytical white paper, uh, June 2020, that's next month in the coming weeks. Um, so look forward to that uh, summary of our two years of modeling efforts and it'll show all of our results, our findings, our data sources and conclusions. It'll identify the near and medium term industrial and power facilities um, and show some of the same optimized regional CO2 transport networks that we saw. So in the, in the near medium term, we can, we can build a transport network to harness that potential provided by the 45Q tax credit, but really in the longer term, um, we can achieve economy-wide deployment and, and expanded uh, storage in deep saline formations for, for long-term CO2 sequestration. And that is really achieved by uh, long-term planning, regional coordination, and the establishment of regional hubs. So thanks a lot uh, for following along in this presentation. And um, Brad and I will be back at the end of this webinar for a Q&A session. And I'll hand it back over to Brendan and Andrew. Thank you very much, Dane. And uh, we can go directly to, uh, to Andrew now, uh, Andrew Duguid with uh, Battelle. And Andrew leads up the, uh, the Department of Energy funded Carbon Safe Project and uh, uh, has a, a ton of experience with all aspects of this work, geology and uh, industrial capture and uh, economics. Um, Andrew, I, I can see your slides, so it looks like you're ready to go. Yeah, good, all right. So you can both hear me and see my slides, so I, I think in, indeed um, we are ready to go. Um, so I, again, I wanna thank the audience for, for being here today. Um, the first two talks were a, a little more it's hard to imagine more regional than with what i'm going to talk about but i think they are and they're maybe a little more theoretical so so this is a, a project the integrated mid continent stacks carbon storage hub which is kind of a mouthful is a project we've been working on um, for about three and a half years it's uh, supported by the u.s department of energy and we are looking to develop exactly that a hub so you, you kind of heard the concept and and this is taking the, the theory just a little bit Further, um, we're in our second phase 
of the project. And unfortunately, it will be our last DOE supported phase, but we are looking for, for other support to try to keep moving forward. Um, so I'm the, the principal investigator for the project, but I am by no means responsible for the success of the project so far. And so this slide, this is my team. Um, I could not do this project without this team and, and we would not be where we are without these folks. So um, I, I'm gonna, if I read these off, I'm gonna screw something up. So it's right here. I wanna thank everybody that has helped out with, with this project. Um, as a way of introduction, so we are looking to gather um, CO2 from uh, Iowa, um, Nebraska, and Kansas, but more of the gathering in, in Iowa and Nebraska and a little bit of transport uh, south, uh, southwest and then south into Kansas for storage. Um, both a good portion of Nebraska and, and most of Kansas have really good storage um, and potential for stack storage. And what I mean by stack storage is if you think about the ground as a series of layers of geologic units, you could put it in more than one of those layers. So if you think about a cake, if I could sort of inject stuff between layers of frosting um, or, or layers of cake, that, that kind of the, the same way. Um, the overall objective for the project is to develop a, a Midwestern carbon storage, carbon storage facility having multiple sites with 50 million metric tons or greater capacity um, for safe permanent storage. And the 50 million ton number, it's, it's not terribly important that it's exactly 50 million, but that would set us into a range of being a commercial project. And that's part of what Carbon Safe and the hub want to do is, is really have an effect on, on on the commercial industry and the amounts of CO2 going in the ground to have an impact on climate. Um, there are a lot of sub objectives for the project. Uh, those sub objectives um, include demonstrating multiple sites with this 50 million metric ton storage. Um, we have two sites in Nebraska and one site in Kansas as we're sort of moving towards phase three. Um, develop storage scenarios that would provide a basis for permitting. So you can't just go put CO2 in the ground um, on your own. You've got to get permits through US EPA. To do that and to, to get those permits, you need a lot of information to, to prove that you're doing it safely. So in creating those scenarios and to collect the right data is important. Um, demonstrate long-term seal integrity. So you don't just put CO2 in the ground and expect it to stay without looking. You have to make sure that you have the right kind of rocks to hold it in the ground. So we, we've, we've been doing that. Uh, strategies to manage CO2 from multiple sources. So I think um, in both Brad and, and Dane's slide, you saw hundreds of CO2 sources. The logistics of working with multiple sources means that you have to understand how the transport network is gonna going to work when you may have sources online and offline and, and how you're going to keep a constant stream of CO2 to, to keep feeding the, the storage or the EOR projects. And then we want to, we actually think this could get bigger. So one of the things we want to do is leverage the data we've collected to, to make this e even bigger. So can we make this become three to 10 storage sites? And I think you saw from Dane's slides that that, that wouldn't be terribly difficult. There's lots of storage targets and lots of sources. Um, public outreach is super important. Uh, if you, the public is against you, you're never gonna have a project. So educating the public and identifying uh, regulatory barriers that could, could affect the project and then learning how to mitigate those. And by mitigate those, I don't mean that they go away. I mean that you educate the public and then they support the project is the, the kind of mitigation we're looking at. And then finally, a, a detailed uh, commercial development plan. So, you know, this just isn't going to happen willy nilly. We really need to have a plan to help with the rollout. So, those are the, the sub objectives uh, of the project. Um, we're going to jump right in. So, here's a map of the area. Um, and you saw uh, a bigger map of the United States earlier. Uh, we've sort of divided early on the project into a source corridor, which could be this sort of yellow. Um, figure at the top where there's lots of ethanol plants. And the reasons we wanted a lot of ethanol plants is that capture is relatively inexpensive. So it could be implemented on a time frame to meet DOE's requirement of 2025. 
Um, we also have uh, coal-fired power plants in the project. We would expect that they would come on slightly after the ethanol plants, but the ethanol plants would, would be key to establishing the, the transportation. And then we have a uh, stack storage corridor. So the western part of Nebraska and Kansas, um, this green box here, and actually you could extend that green box up above Madrid, um, Nebraska, because we, we looked at that site as well, have lots of opportunities for, for both saline storage and for um, enhanced oil recovery. Um, I want to point out, and you saw this on some of the maps early on, that that geologic units don't stop at state boundaries, but research does. So if you look here on sort of the west, the northeastern side of Kansas, um, and going into Nebraska, where you've got this stacked oil field storage area at the border, and it doesn't go into Nebraska there, it very likely does, but the research hasn't been done. So anytime you look at a map and say, oh, it just stops at the border, know that, that there's probably something going on on the other side. Um, I, I say this because I think the audience might have a lot of folks sitting on the other side of that border, border today, and I want to make sure that you know you may still have opportunities for, for saline storage. Um, in any case, so we've done a lot of work at Madrid uh, Sleepy Hollow Field, which is the biggest oil field in Nebraska, and then Patterson Highness Heartland Field in Kansas. Um, Sleepy Hollow and Patterson, we've been drilling characterization wells. In Madrid, we've looked at uh, 2D seismic. All three of these sites have opportunities, good opportunities for both saline storage, and then the Sleepy Hollow and Patterson sites have an opportunity for enhanced oil recovery as well. So I think I talked about corridors. Um, again, there's, there's multiple ethanol plants in, in, in the corridor, probably way more than 16 at this point. We've had a lot of people expressing um, a, a want to join the project, and we don't say no. Anybody that wants to join or, or get information from us is, is welcome. And then there are other sources, some very big power plants, including a, a couple from Nebraska Public Power District who have been a big supporter of this project. And on the previous map, that, that Madrid site is very close to a seven and a half million ton a year um, coal fired power plant that actually has a DOE uh, capture study for the front end engineering and design for capture. So they are well um, on the way to capturing CO2 that could then be utilized. All right. So going to switch gears. That's kind of the basics. Um, you saw some economics. These are some, some theoretical transportation routes um, th that we've looked at in the project. And CAB um, are, it's Columbus, Albion, and Blair, Nebraska. So that's what CAB stands for. You can kind of see it in, in map A. I don't know if you can see my cursor or not, but I'm moving it there. And that's where there's some, some reasonably big ethanol plants. Uh, any ethanol plant um, that, that shows up here is big enough to meet uh, IRS's uh, 45Q requirements, but these three are the biggest in the state um, based on EPA data at the time. And what we did was we, we connected those up to, to look at what the transportation net would, network would look like. So the, these are just a couple of different scenarios. Um, the number one and two have uh, 344 and a 295 uh, mile uh, transportation network. Uh, number three is this jail gentleman station near uh, near the Madrid site um, in North Platte, Nebraska. And that was just by itself uh, going to Sleepy Hollow Field. Um, so that was just a 79 mile straight line source. And then we looked at what it would take, and this is th these, these plants were from an earlier uh, GPI paper, to get all the way to the Permian Basin. Because we wanted to understand what kinds of costs we would be dealing with, especially considering the uh, 45Q credit amounts. And so, and, and then I have updated numbers for individual plants, but but I, I'm not going to go in into those. These are these were were what we put together at the time. And what we end up seeing is that if I take my transportation and my capture costs and my overall uh, storage costs, that I'm right on the verge of being able to do. Um, carbon capture and storage for saline projects. Uh, within the 45Q credit. So, you know, if we take, uh, for scenarios one and two, 
I'm at 42 and 40 dollars. 42 and change and $40 and change per ton. And then if I add on $9 approximately for storage, I'm just over that $50 a ton um, amount. And actually those numbers have and will come down as compression costs and other things for ethanol plants become cheaper. Because this is a fully proved commercial technology on the, on the capture. Um, and then I want to point out that right now, a project like Gerald Gentleman Station um, capture and transport is still probably prohibitive for just the the for just saline storage. Um, they might require something like a, an EOR project. Although I expect that coal-fired power plant capture costs are going to come way down. Um, in talking to to GGS folks, they expect them to be cheaper than what we've modeled here. Um, Enhanced oil recovery. So looking at at what would go on, and this was definitely pre-crash costs. I think we assumed about a $60 a ton barrel of oil. And of course, today it is not at that. But what we end up seeing is on a per pattern basis that there, with uh, the 45Q EOR credit, so about $35 a ton credit, we have a net present value of a positive 40-ish dollars a ton for the first two scenarios, and a net present value of positive $19 a ton for the GGS scenario. So what, what that ends up saying is that there is a commercial benefit to doing these projects with EOR. Um, right now, everything is shut in. So the, the, these numbers are wrong, but one would hope in the next couple of years, the oil industry gets its feet under it again, and these numbers become more representative. I also want to point out that even without the credit, so the, the the lower part of this table, that this EOR project was still going to make money on a per pattern basis. So this project could happen without the credits, uh, assuming oil recovers. All right, so we talked a little bit about economics. I want to switch over to to geology just a little bit. Um, I will try not to get too deep into geology um, for those on the phone that don't love geology, but for those that haven't seen it before, um, what we have on the left side of the screen is a stratigraphic column of both southwest Nebraska and uh, extending all the way down to southwest Kansas. So the upper portion, um, this Pennsylvanian section and this Permian section of the rocks are generally similar in both Nebraska and Kansas. And what I, when I was saying earlier, kind of, and it's a very simple kind of idea, but if you think about these layers as sort of like layers of cakes on top of each other, You've got layers of different kinds of rocks. Uh, and in this case here, the this blue color represents where we might be uh, doing storage. Excuse me, I take that back, it doesn't today. Where it says deep saline is where we might be doing storage. Um, so on, in the Nebraska, it's the Wabanzi all the way down to the Douglas, and then go a little further down into the Lansing, Kansas City to the Basal Sandstone. And there are a couple of oil bearing units there. I would not expect a saline project to happen in these oil bearing units unless there's nobody producing oil in that area anymore. Those probably become EOR projects. Um, looking at Kansas, we can actually go a little deeper and we start to look at the Viola, the Simpson, and the Arbuckle formations as our deep saline storage projects. And these are regionally extensive formations that are already used to store water, um, wastewater from, from uh, EOR, from uh, oil production, and they are going to be really good storage targets. Um, so it, it's important that, that we know that those are there and that we understand how they work. And that's what we've been doing um, as we go forward. Looking at, at storage capacities um, in both uh, Kansas at the Patterson Field and the Sleepy Hollow Field here in Nebraska, we estimate that each of these sites has more than sufficient um, potential. So if we look at this P50, the middle uh, the middle estimate on the table, uh, the Kansas site would be able to hold at least 60 million metric tons of CO2. And Sleepy Hollow at, at the time, we were estimating at 94 million tons. Sleepy Hollow is probably slightly less than that based on our characteriz characterization well results, but it's still sufficient for a commercial project. It's also important to point out that we're talking about very large projects. As part of this this uh, this study, 
But if you're an individual ethanol plant and you're producing, say, 100 to 200,000 metric tons a year, you don't need the best geology that's out there. You need adequate geology. And there's adequate geology in a good portion of Nebraska and e even more of Kansas. All right, so basically what we've done is we've done a study up until this point in the presentation that which was a paper study. So we needed to do a gap assessment to identify what information that we still needed to know to reduce uncertainty in our understanding of these storage complexes. So we went ahead and we, we did some numerical modeling and I haven't shown the modeling, but I'm showing sort of the results of, of the gap analysis in this tornado plot. And what a tornado plot does is, is it sort of the uncertainty is the size of the bars that make up the tornado. So at the bottom of the, the tornado, I know a lot. And at the top of the tornado, I have a lot of uncertainty in, in, in the data and they affect my model in a bigger way. So we, we rank the things towards the top and then go to the field to collect more data. Um, so for Sleepy Hollow Field, we took the information that we have. So these are wells in Sleepy Hollow Field. And we worked with the operator at Sleepy Hollow Field to, to pick a location for a new well. We ended up with option two. And we went ahead and drilled a well in that area. So th that's what we're looking at here. Um, on the right side of the screen are some a photo of one of the cores that we collected. So we actually go and collect rock samples and measure them in a laboratory. Um, on the left-hand side of the screen is, is the, uh, the coring vendor putting in the bit that collected that core. And we focused on the deep saline intervals. So Sleepy Hollow Field, we know a lot about the oil bearing intervals because they've been collecting oil at the field for, for decades. Um, we collected about 110 feet of core, and then we did a fairly significant logging um, um, job out there to, to collect information to go along with that core. And we take that back and we put it into our numerical model to, to do estimates of the field. Um, in addition to Sleepy Hollow, we've been doing the same thing at um, in Kansas at Patterson Highness Heartland Field. Um, at, at Patterson Highness Heartland Field, we had less information on the deep subsurface. So we started out with a three-dimensional seismic survey. So you got a picture of the field at the right, and this was partway through collecting the survey. So you can see that the part of it is done and part of it's remaining. And then these are the vibe trucks. So you actually have to work with the, the local landowners to make sure we can get access to to the land to go ahead and, and vibrate, so send these sound waves into the ground to make our picture. And then we have to pay for all the, the crop damages that, that we do. So we work with the, the landowners to do that, which actually works, goes a long way towards outreach later because we'll have relationships to collect data. Um, kind of switching gears again real quick, looking at transport routes. You saw what uh, Dane presented on kind of a, a, a bigger regional basis. We did the same thing using the same tools, using SimCCS. Uh, we went ahead and, and tried to figure out how might this project build out. And so some things that are important to understand, especially on the ethanol plant side of the project, is that natural gas is used as a fuel for processing corn at most of the plants. And these natural gas pipeline routes um, run to every ethanol plant in Nebraska and Kansas. So we've got existing rights of way, <coughs> excuse me, uh, for storage, or excuse me, for transport. And these pipeline routes run within three miles of each of the sites we looked at for storage. So we should be able to, without putting in new right of way, move CO2 from source to sink without, without having to cross anything that hasn't been crossed before. And then these routes are generated um, through a cost-weighted surface. So looking at the actual geography and the expected costs um, to, to run pipelines and, and a few other factors that, that we've added to try to develop routes. And, and we also have the ability to hardwire our sources into the system. So sources that we knew would be part of the project like ADM's uh, Columbus, Nebraska ethanol plant or Nebraska Public Power's uh, Gerald Gentleman Station, we can hardwire in and make sure that, that they stay included and, and they become part of the build out. And then the other ones go ahead and look at the cost surface to, to determine if they'll become part of the build out. And we, we end up with a, it's a, a series of different uh, possible uh, route growths. Um, but that's 
that's good, but it, it didn't include some other things that we wanted to include, which would be things like geographic barriers. So what is the air quality? What is what what surface water aquifers, wetlands, what things in the area might affect my pipeline route? And if I want to avoid them, what would my route do? So we added these things to SimCCS. <clears throat> and I think it's clearest at the bottom of the figure that the original configuration that SimCCS came up with is this brown line that I'm tracing uh, with my cursor. But if when I included all the things on the right side, or excuse me, on the left side of the screen, I ended up with this red route over here that, that helps me avoid um, things like protected lands or, or maybe protected wildlife um, that, that it's important to avoid and, and protect. So we, we did this um, to help us develop the project further, and it's something that, that's been really useful. Um, so this is just a little bit more showing more updated uh, pipeline routes. Um, and this takes us all the way from source to sink. And so I think I'm coming to the summary slide. Um, so right now, uh, data collection has been um, conducted based on uncertainty and gap assessments. Um, this is nearing completion. We're on our second characterization well in Kansas. I think they finished cementing the well yesterday, so we should be doing some well testing next. Um, the Sleepy Hollow Field characterization, we drilled and cemented a well there. Uh, those tests are also almost done. Um, when the last thing, actually, they might be complete. I think we were waiting on information from the, the geology, uh, the core lab uh, on that last test. Um, we've got our 3D seismic um, collected and processed, and the, the last well, the Heartland well, is underway. Um, in addition to that, risk assessment is ongoing. So to understand how this, this project might affect um, any kinds of risks, both to the environment or to human receptors. We've done a lot of risk assessment work. I, I haven't discussed it here, but it will be in our reports, and I'm happy to share it in, in the future. Uh, with that, I am going to conclude my presentation. Uh, this is my contact information um, if you need to reach me after the webinar, but I'm happy to take questions as we all answer questions. So with that, I will stop sharing my screen. All right, thank you very much, Andrew. And uh, let me just give me one second to shift back over here.